you go into your secret place and you pray unto the Father in secret and then he rewards you in open. Now if you think about that, I was meditating on that and the Lord said, when you spend time with me in the morning time, James, and you praying and seeking me, and then later on that day, you run into somebody in Walmart, your secret time has already gave you a position with me to where now you can hear the voice of the Father and you can speak right into that situation in Walmart or Dollar Store or down there at Crossroads. It doesn't matter where you go, because I tell people this, wherever you go, there you are. There you are. Yep. You're there. So if you changed in here, then that scripture I just read, his presence is everywhere. So I'm not present. So we've been teaching on this, occupying your spiritual reality. And this is the fifth teaching. And this teaching was titled Spiritual Revelation. What and how the Spirit reveals. And I started in Genesis 1, just a little background to catch you up. I started in Genesis 1, where it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of, the, of God moved upon the face of the water. And I just gave you an understanding about when God, as a Spirit, moved, He moved, and that's what changed the, the, the situation from being without form, and the situation from being void and darkness on the earth. It changed because the Spirit of God moved. And so when we have the Spirit of God in us, I brought out to you in reference to Genesis 6, 6 talked about uh, the Lord said that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men in Genesis 6, 1, 2, 3. It came to pass that when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, the daughters were born unto them. And it's fast forward a little bit. He said, the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh. And I told you, if you're operating in the flesh, and this old flesh you're being is here all the time. And some people give the devil credit. Well, the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil done this, the devil's on me. Well, I got a news for you. The Bible teaches us in Ephesians 6 about the weapons that we have. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. We can stick the devil any time. So yeah. Jesus done the same thing. Every time the enemy would come to him when he was in the wilderness, he would say, it is written. Yeah. The Logos word, the Logos word. We've been talking about that. When you use the Logos word in the midst of circumstances and situations with authority. Now, when we talk about authority, we're talking about the exousia power, the delegated influence that you've been given. When you've been given the delegated influence, according to John 1 and verse 13 and 14 there, I talked about that. You've been given the exousia of power that's delegated the influence. I can delegate the word of God and speak to the something in reference to what the word said. And Amen. boom, the word will work. Because Jesus, uh, the Spirit says in Isaiah 53, that the word will not go out and return void, but it will accomplish that which was sent out to accomplish. Now, if you look at all that and put all that together, we, we win this thing. Amen. The battle's already won. It's written. It's just between you and, like I said, the flesh. The flesh is always available, and the flesh is always here. It's between you and your flesh. Can you get your flesh out of the way that you don't serve it and operate in the spirit realm? Because Genesis 6 said that his spirit won't always strive with the flesh, with men. And he said, for, he, for that he also is flesh. And I'm going to tell you, strive means compete. Don't let your flesh strive with the spirit of God that's in you. Because if the flesh is winning, then you're just a dead man walking. According to Ephesians chapter 3, you know, you're a dead man walking. So I, I went on and talked about all that. And I talked about Pharaoh and when he, the Bible said that in Genesis 41 that Pharaoh was a discreet and wise man. And uh, discreet was to be separated mentally. That means my mental perception of my thinking in reference to the now and the here and now and the earthly realm. I've got to separate my mental from my spiritual and always operate in the spirit realm to be able to please God. The Bible says if you can't, they that walk in the, in the flesh, I'm paraphrasing, say walk in the flesh cannot please God. You can't please God in the flesh. you got to walk in the spirit. That's how you connect with him. So when I was talking about that, I brought it out uh, again, another scripture on just background here. In, in Exodus 31, 
when he talked about Basileel, the Bible said that Moses, the Lord spoke to Moses in Exodus 31, 3 through 5. The Lord spoke to Moses and said he had named Basileel the son of Uri. He went on to say he filled him with the Spirit. And I told you in the last teaching, in the Old Testament patriarchs, nobody was ever indwelled with the Spirit. The Spirit would come upon them. The Spirit will move on them to accomplish what he needed to accomplish. And the last point I made was that God has purpose in every one of us, gifts and callings and talents and, and greatness within us. There's greatness inside of every one of us. We It's in us because God destined us that, to be that way. And the scripture, I, I gave you scripture on that, but because over the Old Testament, it said he gave Bezalel uh, Filled him with the Spirit, but the Scripture said, in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. I told you, as I was telling you that, all these things was in him when the Spirit came up on him and it manifested God doing the greatness through him based on all these things. That means if you, and you might know this yourself, there may be somebody you know that may not know the Lord at this time. But you know that they got greatness in them, or you know that they're getting shut off the back, or whatever. They, they got some character within them that's displaying the thing that God put in them before the foundations of the world. It's there. It's just we got to connect them to the source. Because now they probably the one thinking, oh, I got this in the back of donuts. You know, they, they think they all this in the back of chips because they can do this and they can do that. But it's all because. God placed it in him. And I gave you that scripture out of uh, Exodus 31. And then I brought out the scripture right before we go into today's teaching of God. I brought out the scripture in Ephesians 2 and 10. It says, for we are his workmanship. When I read that scripture in Exodus 31, it says that, that he gave him in wisdom and in knowledge, I mean, excuse me, in wisdom and understanding and in knowledge and all manner of workmanship. And I brought out that word workmanship the word workmanship in the New Testament means that it's a finished product. So we've already finished. Before the foundation of the world, you're a finished product in the spirit realm. You're finished. But you just got to tap into that daily as you walk and learn and grow and initiate. I've told you once before, we, we say sometimes, Lord, bless me. But you just pray in a ignorant prayer when you say, Lord, bless me. Because Ephesians says that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. So you've already been blessed. You just said, Lord, let me be able to attain, acknowledge, and understand all the blessings you want me to walk in, and I can appropriate them and give you all the honor and all the glory. It's a day-to-day -day endeavor. So you're a finished product. Then brings us to today's teaching to move on to bring about what the Lord showed me in reference to this. The first scripture I have here is Romans 15, 1 through 4. Everybody all right? All right, I'm going to move right through here quickly. Romans 15, 1 through 4 says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Remember what I said a while ago about the person that don't know the Lord? He may have some gifts and calling. He may be talented, may be great in something that God has already put in him. I've heard people say that, boy, he can show sure saying, boy, he is, he is gifted. He may be gifted, but if he's saying by the work of his own flesh, he may have a beautiful voice, but the anointing is what makes it bring glory to God, his anointing on him. So he needs to be grounded in the Lord that when he's saying, not only are he singing for the, his giftings or his purposely got a good voice, but he's singing because he's anointed and he's just ministering to the people to give the word of the Lord through the song to the people as he ministered. Now you go to that, he said, we bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves, let no, excuse me, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. And that's meaning something there because you're not, there's one of the scriptures I was talking about that brings it to my members and uh, I think it's Ephesians 6 and verse 18 where it talks about pray for that we to pray with every prayer on all occasions in the spirit and not for us but for the saints too. So your prayer is not only for you, 
It's for those that you know that are saints, or those, those that you know in your circle. They may not be a saint right now, but you know your prayer. And a while ago, as I finished my prayer, I reminded the Lord from the word he has in his Bible that the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. So I know what I pray went to avail and to accomplish what it went out to accomplish because I pray what his word said. So when we're praying for our neighbor, and here's the point I really like in this next verse. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So everything you read in the Old Testament scriptures was written aforetime for your learning that you can have hope and understanding and patience and comfort you through the scriptures. If you read it and you say, boy, that Moses was something else. Well, it was just written for you to have. You look in the book of uh, Hebrews 11 in the Hall of Faith, in the book of faith there, all that was written for you to have patience and comfort in the scriptures that you can have hope. Because they were just people like me and you. Moses and, and Job and all them. But they went through a lot of things. But they didn't even have the Spirit of God in them. So you know they didn't have TV and, and all the stuff we had too that gets us, off our, gets us off track sometimes. I guarantee you that made a difference in their life because they had the, the scrolls or whatever of they had, what scripture they had and they pondered on it. And they had their calling on the name of the Lord. So many times in the Bible that God said to the children of Israel, if you hearken to the voice of the Lord, hearken to the voice. Now I'm going to tell you something. That's all they had in those times. I can be praying sometime and I can feel the Spirit of the Lord come over me and a scripture come in my mind and I just know it was the Holy Spirit revealing something to me. I said, that's good, Lord. I get my Bible out right quick and go in and then show me something else. He show me something else. He show me something else. I think, wow, that was awesome. But that's just because he abides in me. He dwells in me. He dwells in you if you've been born again. And that's the key. But when we come to this understanding that everything was written before time, it was written for our learning, and we might have hope through the scripture. So the first scripture I want to show you, and I'm going to show you some scripture here based out of the Old Testament patriarchs to where you can see the Spirit of God didn't dwell in them, but he came upon them, moved on them, moved through them, and he accomplished what he needed to accomplish through all these people I'm going to show you in the Bible. Then we'll give you a New Testament counteract scripture to counter what Thus says the Lord in the New Covenant, according to that scriptural reference of what we're going to read. So, first scripture, Numbers chapter 11, we're talking about Moses here. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take uh, the Spirit. You notice I told you, let me stop right quick, for those of you who may not remember this. Every time you look at the word Spirit in the Bible, and it's a small letter, He's talking about, he may be referring to God, the Spirit, but yet he's saying in the reference to a lot of times in the Old Testament because God didn't indwell them, he's speaking of the Spirit of God, but, but he's speaking of that which he would do upon them. He would move his Spirit upon them because he didn't indwell them. Most of the scripture in the New Testament, you see a lot of them was capital because the Spirit of God moved up, uh, the Spirit of God filled them and they spoke in tongues. That's a capital because he was in them and not on them. But anyway, that's free, okay? That's free stuff. And I will take of my take of the spirit which is upon thee, see, upon thee, and will put it upon them. He's gonna take his the spirit that he put up on Moses, and he's gonna put that same spirit upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee that thou bear it not thyself alone. In other words, Moses was getting so overwhelmed with all the stuff that the Israelites was giving him trouble on, he was burning more so than ever. And the Lord told him to call on 70 people. And he's going to take the spirit of, he put on him, he's going to put on them 70, and they're going to help him do what he called to do. And now watch this. When we look at that and understand that, God did that for Moses. Now watch this. 
in Galatians 6 and 1, the Bible says, Brethren, if, if a man is overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And what's the two say? Bear ye another's, one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So the same spirit that God put on Moses and, took and put on them to help them bear the burdens of the people in the New Testament scripture, it said if you're spiritual, you have, to, you have to put that in context with who you are. If you're spiritual, you, you, you go to a person that's in a fault. Don't sit up and say, hey, Father, you know I heard, oh, so-and-so, 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 done so-and-so, so Now you gossiping, or you're in a place where you're out of alignment with what the Word said. If I knew something was going on with a brother or sister in the church, I'm spiritual. I'm going to go to them to restore them with the spirit of meekness. I mean gentle. Remember what the, the uh, scriptures are in Michael 6 and 8? Do just love mercy, and walk humbly. When I go, the love mercy part goes right into the spirit of meekness because when you love mercy, you're merciful. So you're going to a person with gentleness and not jumping on them and saying, oh, I knew you was going to fail. Oh, I knew you was going to sin. No, when you go with that attitude, you lost them already. You go to them with the spirit of meekness, gentleness, considering yourself, lest thou also be tempted. In other words, if they go off and get on in your faith, and you come go with them in the, remember the scripture before, you go to them and you in the fleshly realm, you both will be out of line. You'll never get that person to understand what you know that they need prayer about or what you know that they need help on or what you can release to them according to the word of God. But he said, bury ye another's burdens, and then if you do, you fulfill the law of Christ. And, and on down here, look, I mean, in this passage here, uh, I think it's the next verse or maybe verse 4. He said, bear your own burdens. Bear ye your own burden. Now, when I looked that up, I got a teaching that I talked about that one time. The word burdens there is one Greek word, and the other word burden is another Greek word, which he said, bear your own burdens. That Greek word means as a ship has a cargo on it. Meaning that whatever God's given you as a gift and a calling and a purpose on your life, it's a burden, but it's a burden as if a ship had a cargo and before that people can get the cargo, all the things that's on the ship in the cargo, they'll have to, the ship will have to get to that locality. So you being a burden with what God's put in you, you ever say to yourself, well, that just burdened my heart, I'm just going to pray for this. You was burdened because in your heart, God had placed in you spiritual discernment that you can pray for that person based on the need that they had. So I, I got to teach you on that, but moving right along, I think the word uh, there in here, the word burden is the word, I got it written here, is the word baros. It means a load or abundance or weight. So you bear somebody else's load or bear somebody else's weight that they're going through. Now, can you burn somebody else's weight? Well, I got enough to burn on my own, brother. Mm -hmm. Well, if you got enough to burn on your own, it goes back to the first of that scripture. If someone's overtaking their fault, you which are spiritual, if you're spiritual, then you're casting all your care upon the Lord, Amen. and you're not burdened with nothing. I'm not burdened with anything right now. I got situations I'm praying about right now, but I've given it to the Lord. Amen. I've given it to the Lord already, and I know He's going to do great and exceedingly abundantly more than I can even ask or think, according to the Word. So, hallelujah. See, if you know what the Word says, you put all that together, and you have peace that surpasses all understanding. Mm -hmm. And you say, I don't know why you're so peaceful. Well, it ain't my mindset to be in a sense of turmoil. So, I'm going to cast all my care upon the Lord. So, that being said, the same spirit that moved upon Moses and gave him the ability to give to 70 more to be able to help them burden that was burning down, the, the scripture says we can do it in the new covenant. Now, this next scripture says in Numbers 11, 25, and 26, it says, And the Lord came down in a cloud, 
spake unto him and took of uh, the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the seventy elders. This is, I think it's said relating to some of the passages I just read earlier in Numbers 11 and, and 17. But this is uh, 25 through 26. And it says, and gave it unto the seventy elders and it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, what did they do? Prophesied and did not cease. Now you know in the New Testament scripture, when we get filled with the Holy Ghost, it said we speak in tongues and prophesy. They prophesied in them when the Spirit came up on them. But, verse 26, but there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad, and the Spirit rested upon them, and they were and they were of them they that were written, but when not out, went not out unto the tabernacle. And they prophesied in the camp. Now, I'm telling you, the Spirit of God would move upon them, and it did the same thing as it moved upon them in the Old Testament as it does with us in the New Testament. Another scripture here, uh, this is talking about old denial in Judges 3, 9 and 10. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and the Lord raised up a deliverer of the children of Israel who delivered them, even Openile, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, and the, there's a big letter, see, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war, and the Lord delivered all of that big word, Christian, Christian, man, snakes, whatever, king of Mesopotamia into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Cushorisamania. Boy, that's a big word. But the, the, the thing about it is, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. I know when we get an opportunity to look at a situation and assess it according to what we need to give an answer to, the Bible says in Peter, I think it is, that we need to have uh, without a reason of doubt of the hope that lies in us. Everybody should have a reason of that without a reason of doubt of the hope that lies in you. He judged Israel and he went out to war and he Lord delivered them. So that scripture there tells us that Omanile the Nile only judged. If you look in the book of Judges, you see all those judges in there. They judged because the Lord directed them. Now watch this in Samson, about Samson. That scripture there, Judges 13 and, 30, and 25, I think that's, let me, let me read it, then we'll, we'll go further with, with the understanding of it. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Ephraim. And now that is about Samson. I, I, I wish I had went ahead and put a little more in there. I'm just finding scripture of people that in the Old Testament was moved upon by the Spirit. And that's about Samson. The next scripture is about David. We, we, we know how David was. David, in chapter 51 of Psalms, said this, Cast, not, cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You don't usually see him say Holy Spirit, but that's what David said. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. And you remember when I, we read that scripture in Psalm 16 and 11 a while ago? It says that where the, in the, where the presence of the Lord is, there's joy. Now, Jeff, David knew this. He said, restore, he, after he had sinned with Bathsheba, he said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Not my salvation, thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. Now, I think I'm looking no, I didn't look up the word. I thought I had a word I looked up in here, in free spirit. But uh, David asked the Holy Spirit not to be taken from him after the Bathsheba consequence. And I'm going to tell you something. I, I gave you scripture in one of the teachings, and it comes back to mind. Uh, Michael 3 and 4, Exodus, uh, Exodus 33, 32, 33, and Isaiah 59 and 2. 
and write them down and if you, and if you can go back and look at them. It says, your sin separates you from you and God. And that's important when we understand that. I want to read one of them to you just for your understanding, for clarity. I, didn't, I don't have that. I've been listening to some audio Bible, and he just has a tendency to just take off in the audio mode. But when we understand that sin separates us, the flesh separates us from walking in the spirit, and sin separates us from the Lord. And, and we don't never want to, to be in a place where we're separated from God. We can't walk in the Spirit. We can't operate in the Spirit. We can't do the things that the Spirit requires of us to do if we are walking in the flesh. Here in Exodus 32 and 33, it says, yet, 32 and 33, it says, yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, block me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. And in verse 33 it says, like I said, Exodus 32 and 33, and the Lord said unto Moses, whoever has sinned against me, him I will block out of my book. Now, God knew that that was going to be a problem with people if they walked in sin. So he gives us this, that's why I gave you the first scripture a while ago, the scripture that gives us the understanding that things were written before time was written for our learning. Uh, Michael chapter 3 and verse 4. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time as they have behaved themselves ill in their doing. He hides his face from you because of your doings. You're operating in the flesh and you're doing ill, then he'll hide his face from you. And I've got this one more here. Uh, Isaiah 59 and 2. This scripture here tells us that I've got to learn how to walk in the Spirit, stay in the Spirit. Now you say, well, Brother James, you ain't going to always be in the Spirit. Well, you believe that, and guess what? You'll not always be able to like, come into the place of spirituality from your standpoint of not believing. Because the Bible says in Proverbs 24 and 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if you think you ain't going to always be in operating the spirit, you just put a, 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 a levy right there for you to get over. You can't get over that levy because in your mind you think you can. You think you can, or if you think you can, you're right. Isaiah 59 and 2 said, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. You think about that. He don't hear if your sins are separate. That's why it's so important to repent of your sins and walk in the Spirit. If we're going to allow the Spirit to reveal Himself through me, I've got to be able to walk according to the Word of God and apply it in a spiritual realm. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them, said the Lord. My Spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, said the Lord, from henceforth, forever and forever. It was just Isaiah prophesying here that is, and I talk about covenant a lot. There's five different covenants the Bible teaches about. And we're going to go in there one, one time and teach about the Abraham and, and the, the covenants that uh, David and all the covenants the Bible even speaks of. We, we're going to go into them. Yeah, I slipped my mind on all of them. David, Abraham, Moses, and uh, there's one that I, I usually forget before I get to the new covenant. There's five of them. Abraham, Moses, David, and then there's one that, that slips my mind most of the time. Before I get to the new covenant. There's five covenants that God has ordained through the biblical context, and everyone that walked in those covenants was able to fulfill the purpose that God had for them. The next scripture, 
That's Isaiah 59. The next scripture, Ezekiel. Ezekiel, prophet. He's a major, a major prophet. And the Spirit entered into me. Now here, it says it entered into him. The Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me and set me upon my feet that I heard them that heard him that spake unto me. I believe giving him ears to hear reference the biggest point that I see in that passage. And the Spirit entered into me. He spake unto me and set upon my feet that I heard him that speak unto me. Now I'm going to tell you something related to spiritual quality. Jesus said to his disciples so many times as they, he gave a parable in the midst of all the people that was around and they would ask him in their private, Lord, what does that parable mean? And he would tell them what the parable meant. And as he told them what the parable meant, he would sometimes say, how long am I going to have to be with you? That he that has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying. And he would always say what the Spirit is saying. Not what he said, what the Spirit is saying. So it's important to understand when Ezekiel said this, the Spirit gave him ears to hear. And this is important when we come into, I told you in one of the teachings already, it's not so alone that we follow the Word of God, but if we don't follow the Word of God, we'll never be in tune to hear the Spirit of God. Because that's what gives me the direction on following the Word of God to be in tune to hear God. If you don't follow the Word of God, then guess what? Chances are you won't hear the Spirit of God because He's leading you and guiding you according to the Word. Remember the teaching we were talking about? The Lagos Word? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and we beheld His glory, glory the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, and the light came, and it separated the light from darkness. You remember we talked about that in one of the teachings? That's what happens with the Word in me and you. It separates light from darkness. Then if I can listen to the Word and not walk in darkness, then the light will, will overcome the darkness, Therefore, when I can walk according to the word, it opens the door that when the Lord speaks to me, he directs me according first to the word, but then I can be able to have ears to hear that he will lead me and guide me according to his spirit. That's important to walk. You, you ask yourself, well, Brother Jane, I don't hear God. I don't hear God. I had somebody tell me that one time. I don't hear God, Brother Jane, like you say he do. I don't hear God. I said, well, first of all, don't compare you to me. Don't compare that. There's the Bible saying he is comparing himself among himself is not wise. So I can't compare myself to T.D. Jakes or nobody. But T.D. Jakes ain't James Bucket, and I ain't T.D. Jakes. I can't compare myself to nobody. Amen. But I told him, first thing, don't compare yourself. And the second thing is, how often are you in the Word of God, getting the Word of God, studying it? Well, that's something I, I, I slack on. I, I don't read a lot. Mm -hmm. There you go. You don't read the Word a lot, that's your first, second, not comparing to me. Your second problem is you're not putting enough word in you to get a foundation of what the word is saying to where God can lead you and guide you to all truth. Remember Proverbs chapter 3, lean not to your own understanding. Most of the time, what you see and what you respond and how you act will be according to your own understanding. But if you lean not to your own understanding and a lot of those words of scriptural come up in your mind, let no corrupt communication proceed out your mouth and that which minister grace to the hair and edify. Ephesians chapter 6. If that word come up in you right then, you'll shut your mouth if you follow the Spirit. And God ain't have to say nothing. He just used that word to discern light and darkness. And that's how you allow the Spirit to reveal himself. And you say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for that. Because he just led you and guided you. Amen. That's, that's a point for every Christian. You teach a person to get into the Word. You teach a person to have an intimacy with God in the, through the Word of God. Some people say, well, I can't. I, I, just, I just don't understand. Well, don't let no excuse keep you from being able to get in the presence of the Lord and say, Lord, tell him that. Don't tell me. Say, Lord, I don't understand. Would you show me how to understand? First thing he might say, get your dictionary where you can look up definitions of the Word. That's what he told me one time. 
So I started doing definitions, and then I started finding words that were defined as a word in a one scripture that wrap us over to a word that came up in another scripture. Then I could put that scripture to that scripture based on the word that came up in it from a defined word. That's spiritual revelation. That's where I'm I'm so so important about it's so important about spiritual revelation. What and how the spirit reveals. He reveals it to you through the word. But if you ain't in the word, you can bet you're gonna miss the spirit of God directing you and guiding you. So the next scripture is Ezekiel 3 and 24. That other was 3 and 2, this is 3 and 24. Then the Spirit entered into me. And he says this uh, twice already in the same uh, passage, same uh, prophet, Ezekiel 2 and 2, and then Ezekiel 3 and 24. He said, the Spirit, but you look, it's a, it's, a, it's a small letter. The Spirit entered into me and sat upon my feet and spake with me and said unto me, Go, shut thyself within thine house. Now he's guiding him. I just got to saying a whole lot of stuff before this, and this scripture comes up and just reminds me. He was guiding him according to the spirit that entered him. Here's the key in reference to Ezekiel's scripture. I said the first scripture, when I back up to you, that first that scripture there, it entered him and he gave him ability to hear what he spoke unto him. And then I get to this one here. It gives him the ability to shut up and get in the present, get in the dying house, within dying house. I think in reference to the spiritual context of that scripture, he spake with me. With me, meaning he was with the Lord. He was, he was in the presence of the Lord. And he said unto me, go, shut thyself within thine house. But I gotta preface this. If you ain't spending time with the Lord, you may not ever get a time where you know that God is saying, okay, get in the presence of, go into your closet. Matthew 6 and 6, remember the scripture I told you earlier? Get into your closet. Has God ever told you, come, come up hither, or come, or seek me, or God has spoken to me before, and I say it this way by myself. You may have experienced it in your own walk with God. A couple of days went by, I hadn't read the Bible, and then later the third day came up. And the Lord said, I long for you. Mm. He longed for me because I've been in his presence on a continuous basis, and then I got tied up, getting caught up in a lot of other stuff, and the Lord told me he longed for me. You know what? The first scripture came to my mind. As a deer panted after the water, so does my heart long for you. That's what came to my mind when the Lord told me, Tell me that. I thought, wow. So I get in the presence of the Lord. Now that's, that's, that's spiritual revelation. When God starts speaking to you that way, that means he wants to commune with you. Amen. He's, what I tell you the scripture was in, in John 4, I think it is, it says, God's a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And, I, and that's the key. He's seeking such to worship him. God is seeking you out to worship with you. He's seeking out a person that will worship him in spirit, born of his spirit, and in truth, doing what the word said. Because Jesus said this in John 17. He said, Lord, sanctify them with thy truth. In verse 17. 17, 17, I believe this word is. He said, sanctify them, Lord. God, Father, sanctify them with the truth. Thy word is truth. So that's what sanctify. Remember when we talked about sanctification and justification in the last teaching? That's what sets you apart, is the Word of God. We have a progressive salvation in doing the Word and operating in your progressive sanctification. God is doing it in and through all the people that He's called out of darkness into His marvelous life. <coughs> so it's important that we understand when Mr. Ezekiel here got to that place. God was giving him direction. And see, as a prophet, he was a prophet, and I would say he had the office of a prophet. Now, office of a prophet and ministry of a prophet is two different terms. We got, I got a teaching on the gifts of the Spirit where I explain that. The office of a prophet is that God placed that prophetic utterance over your life, and it's something that you operate in on a, on a regular basis. 
is the office of a prophet. Also, the ministry of a prophet is that once you get filled with the Spirit, you can flow in the prophetic realm. Because as I, as uh, Revelations say, Revelations 11, I think, it says that the prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. So whatever you testify in is what the Spirit of the Lord is testifying through you, speaking it as the Spirit of prophecy. Scripture is so important when we understand those type of things and we walk according to them. Daniel, let's see, did I get there that? No, Daniel 5 and 11 says this. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of the father of light, of thy father of light, and understanding and wisdom. Remember that understanding and wisdom? And all that went with, but went in Exodus 31, when I read that in the last teaching and I brought it out earlier, I believe that what's within every one of us is the ability to have wisdom and knowledge and understanding. It's in us, but tapping into the Spirit of the Lord brings that to fruition and makes us flow more eloquently, if you would, for lack of better words, if we allow the Lord to move through. He said, Thy Father, like and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. Now all those gifts right there, you, you think about this. A person that's an astrologer, they got a gift that God gave them. And they may be using it opposite of what God called them to do, but it's there. It, it was in them. That means they could prophesy and do the things that God purposed them to do if they change sides, I would say. They come over to the side of the light and not in the side of the darkness. Most times people that get uh, go to the tarot card readers and stuff, and they'll say, you're going to win the lottery. And boy, they get out there and they'll play 150 times the next week thinking that they're going to win it. And they may win it. Ooh, she was right. Yeah, how much money did you spend and how much challenging was you in your mind wasn't peaceful to try to win that because you went over to the dark side. I tell you, people tell me sometimes, God told me he was struggling one time with money and he needed some help. And I said, man, I, I can pray with you. I don't have no money to give. I can pray with you right now. He said, uh, well, just pray for me. I said, I'll just pray right now. I prayed with him. The next day he came back to me and said, man, guess what? God moved. God moved. I said, what happened? He said, somebody came to me, they told me they had some food stamps to sell, and I bought them two for one. <laughs> I said, no, you failed that, buddy. He said, what do you mean? I said, you bought food stamps, which was illegal. That food stamps was assigned to them people, and you bought them from them. I said, you failed that test, God tested you, and you, you, you lost. Oh, I didn't see it like that. Lean to your own understanding. Mm -hmm. See, you can't lean to your own understanding. You come to me and tell me you bought some food stamps. Hey, you done wrong. That's just according to the word of God. That's not obey all the ordinances of the law, Romans said. So reality is, somebody come to me and walk. I said, hey man, uh, you got all them groceries in there. You gonna buy some food stamps? I said, no, I don't buy food stamps. Well, I mean, just let me buy them, man. Buy the groceries and you give me the cash. I said, I tell you what, what is it that you need? What's going on with you? Talk to me. Then they told me they had some situations, certain things, trying to get some gas. I tell you what you do. You hold on, let me get through with this right here. You pull over here at the pump over here, and I'll pump you some gas. And I'll pump you gas. Now, I know I wasn't wrong because I felt in my heart he needed gas. He even got ready to go. This gentleman he ran out of gas, sitting right there. I said, how do you pull in here and stop and run out? I knew I needed gas. We went over there and put something in a jug. He had a young jug. Two little jug in the back of his car, put that in there, and I went out there and put some gas in. The sermon is very important when it comes to spiritual revelation. And not everybody is, wants to do right. Not ever, you know, the Bible says man love darkness rather than it is light. John 3, you read that. Man love darkness rather than he do light. I just got off on that sidetrack about the magicians and astrologers and Chaldeans and soothsayers, because they out there, they got gifts in them, and they gifts from the Lord, but they use them in a 
way that the enemy takes a hold of it and they use them in the opposite of what God's purpose is for them. So I'm getting about ready to close based on the timing. I want to always try to keep this in a perspective to where I can kind of keep it about 30, 40 minutes instead of an hour because I can go on. I've got plenty of scripture to do it, but I'm keeping you in check, okay, Johnny? Hallelujah. Uh, First Chronicles 12 and verse 18 talking about As Amaziah. Then the Spirit came upon Amaziah, who was chief of the captains. Now, what? When you read this about the Spirit coming upon him, do what? It says in Romans 15, what can you get for your learning out of it? How is this going to help apply to you when you read something that the Spirit of the Lord done in somebody in the Old Testament scriptures? Watch this. Then the Spirit came upon Amasai, who was chief of the captains, and he said, Thine are we, David, and on thy side. Thus, son of Jesse, peace, peace be unto thee. And peace be to thine helpers, for thy God helpeth thee. You hear what he said? Thy God helpeth thee. Then David received them and made them captains of the band. Obviously, this situation, it was going on with some stuff that they didn't have peace on. And I want you to understand what Scripture gives you. So many people read John 14 and John 2, 16, and they get this kind of twisted. Going to prepare a place for you, and where I am, you may be also in my father's house of many mansions. And they said, Well, I can't wait to get my mansion. And see, the scripture ain't even speaking about a physical mansion. You're the mansion. He's going to prepare a place that where he is, you be also. And John 17, his high priestly prayer was, Father, I'm paraphrasing how he said, he said, Father, now it's time that I glorify you. You glorify me, Lord, and these that you've given me, that they be one as you and I are one. He's, he's going to prepare a place for you where you can be one with the Father. You can be like he is. And if he's in you, transitionally, on a day-to-day -day basis, the more closer you walk in the Spirit and do the Word, walk according to the Word, and manifest the Word of God, the more you come in oneness with the Father. The more you begin to say what he say and only do what he say. Right. Because the word of God will lead you and guide you to all truth. John 15 and 7 said, when the spirit of truth come upon you, it leads you and guides you to all truth. And that's the key to Christianity. You got somebody missing it and missing it and missing it, chances are they're not following the spirit of God. Question would be, is they really born again? Not to say they're not, and not to question their salvation. But I'm just saying, if you're struggling to walk according to the Spirit, what's hindering you? Let's do a checkup from the neck up. Let's just think about what's going on. You got something in your heart that's sinful? You got unforgiveness in you? Or whatever is there that's keeping you, is defiling you, then you need to find out what it is. Because you need to cut that thing out of you and allow the Lord to do spiritual surgery on you and cut that out of your heart and make you one with him. Purge your heart. Remember the, when I used the scripture in uh, Matthew 5, one of the Beatitudes, he said that, I'm trying to remember the scripture, but it, I said, the pure in heart, they should see God. The pure in heart. Now you're coming to that understanding, if you ain't seen him, let's check your heart. Because he's, he's everywhere. Remember the scripture we read a while ago? His presence is everywhere. If you ain't seen it, then blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Brought that to my remembrance. I was trying to just remember it off the fly, but that's what the scripture said. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And we're going to use one more scripture. And I'm going to close because i got about eight, nine more, and I'm not going to go into all of them. We're going to make this happen. Now, here's a New Testament scripture that's giving us reference to what just happened right in this situation when he said, Then thine are we, David, and on thy side, thou son of Jesse, peace, peace be unto thee, and peace be to thy helpers, for thy God helpeth thee. Now you got to remember that. When I said a while ago in Scripture in Romans 15, everything you read in the Old Testament Scripture about David, Abishai, whomever, how can you apply 
a New Testament or a counterpart of a New Testament scripture to help you be in alignment with that. They were needing peace. They asked. They were needing peace there. So I'm going to show you scripturally how we've been given that. John 14 and 27. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Now just think, if it's his peace, you shouldn't have any problem. If it's his peace, you know, well, I, I just ain't got peace like that. Well, if you got him, you got his peace. The scripture says that. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians 5 and 17 said, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. That scripture teaches us that become, you search that word out, it means it's becoming and becoming and becoming. It's becoming new to me on how to walk in the spirit. James said, I me, mean, James 1, I think in verse 21, he says that be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You deceive yourself to not do the word when you already hear it, then you don't do it. You deceive yourself to you say you're a biblical practicing Christian. If you ain't doing the word, you're not biblically practicing Christian. You're not biblical practicing Christian, then you deceiving yourself to say, I know what the word says. Hey, will somebody tell me one time, I know what the word says. I know what he says now. I said, oh, you doing it? Well, that's another story that they got tickled. I said, well, you know what? The devil knows the Bible. <laughs> the devil knows the scripture, but he ain't doing it. He's doomed. So don't get it twisted now. Don't get it twisted. So he said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That tells you what comes to mind is, I think I got that scripture down here, but 2 Timothy 1 and 7. We have not been given the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. You should be able to walk in that. We should be able to walk in that church. Walk in a sound mind. Why? Because I've been given peace that surpasses all my understanding. What am I standing on my peace? Ephesians 6 says, having done all I can do, stay. If I don't what the word say, and it still hasn't manifested yet, Johnny, what I gotta do? Just stand on what the word says. That's right. And still That's right. and see. The salvation of the Lord. The word of God will not go out and return for And I'm going to stop right there. We'll pick up on Sunday and finish this all out. And I'm thinking this will be the end of this series. I got my little booklet over where the Lord gave me message after message after message. And every word he gave me, he gave me a series on it. The Bible's full of information that bring us, like Romans 15 said, that Things that were written four times was written for our learning. Well, if you look at the patriarchs in the Bible, he asked for peace, 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 peace unto them and to thine that was with them, thy helpers. If you got peace, blessed are the peacemakers. There's another beatitude in, John, in, a, in Matthew 5. I think it said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. I, I already know if I walk according to peace and I am a peacemaker, if peace is upon me, and I enter, what did Jesus tell him when he entered into a house? He said, if you go and you take one, take no staff, no money with you, go on, when you enter into a house, and you paraphrase it now, you preach the kingdom of God, if they receive you, then good. If they don't receive you, so if you walk away from that house, you pray that peace, your peace remain upon you. You don't leave your peace there because they didn't even receive you. You take your peace with you. <laughs> the peace he gave you, you take it with you. And the Lord will sustain you and direct you and guide you. I hope this has been a help to you tonight. I'm thankful and grateful that the Lord gave me something. Before I can even minister this word, I have to apply this word. I was looking at it, and he gave me more stuff as I was doing it. He would give me scripture that would give me a reference to another thing and another thing, and I don't put them all down unless the Holy Spirit tells me to. But I'm thankful and grateful that spiritual revelation, what and how the Spirit reveals. It came upon them, brought them peace, 
May them not be afraid. May them prophesy. May them walk accordingly. May them be directed. He gave them everything they need in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all workmanship. He done it to the Old Testament saints. He'll do it to us. Not only to us, through us. Through us because he abides in us. Hallelujah. So, thankful and grateful. If you're watching this online, whether now or you're watching it in a replay, always remember, if you've got a prayer request, you can go to byfaithenterprise.com. Leave your prayer request there. I will return. Get back to you for it. If you want to, if you want to give to this ministry, you can give by cash app, IHP Ministry. Of course, you got to put a little dollar sign in front of it. IHP Ministry in this present ministry. Same thing for PayPal. PayPal dot p forward slash IHP Ministry. God is good all the time, and I thank you for coming out, and I appreciate 